My next guest is the founding chief executive and managing director of Goldie, as G-O-L-D-I-E, a full service, a consumer-driven brand marketing agency, a self-educated cultural anthropologist. She is a pioneer in culturally relevant, purpose-driven marketing and was the chief architect of one of my all-time favorite campaigns, by Procter and Gamble's My Black is Beautiful. Can't tell you how many times I was part of that tour uh, when I was doing radio. She has been a uh, featured political analyst on NBC News, MSNBC, CNN, and HLN, has been a guest on programs such as HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, The Dr. Phil Show, The Steve Harvey Show, Good Morning America, and and is on the show today to discuss a book that I read this weekend called Paper Gods by Goldie Taylor. Please welcome to my show, Money Making Conversations, my guest, Goldie Taylor. Good morning, Rashawn McDonald. How are you? Goldie, have we met before? You know, I don't know that I have, but I know that we must be only one or at least a half degree of separation. <laughs> I bet we played Who Do You Know? You know, we both ring up a oh thousand Oh, my God. I can't believe it. You know, because I see Steve Harvey show down there. I go, well, did she come on the show? I don't, I don't remember. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been mm-hmm. sitting in the room just, you know, sometimes I've been, sometime I'm there, sometimes I'm not. But great having you on the show. And where are you at? Where are you based at? Let's get that started first. I'm, I'm right here in sunny downtown North Buckhead. Good. Now, this book, uh, we're going to talk about the book, but I wanted to talk about and bring my fans up to speed on basically your brand, who you are and what you represent. And you have an opinion, you you have thoughts, and you share those For thoughts sure. on an ongoing basis. What drives you, Goldie? You know, I think if there's anything that, you know, people have sort of the defining moments in their life, the sitting the moments of things that change the trajectory of all that, uh, they are and do. And, you know, and I think everybody sort of socialized a certain way. I was raised in a place called East St. Louis, right. um, just on the eastern banks of, of um, the Gateway Arch. And, you know, East St. Louis is a tough place, you know, then and it is today. And I just realized, you know, as Barack Obama was coming to growth uh, as Senate, uh, as, as I guess the nominee elect in 2007, mm-hmm. headed towards the presidency that as senator from Illinois, he had never been to East St. Louis. Mm-hmm. So even the U.S. senator for the state hadn't been there. And it, and it sort of let me know right away that, you know, it's not that he didn't care about East St. Louis or, or people who uh, lived that life. Uh, but East St. Louis itself did not have voice, that we did not have a platform for the issues that were most important, most salient to us in our lives. And I decided one morning, I woke up, I said, I'm going to be that voice. Right. So everything, everything wrong in America, I say, is wrong in East St. Louis. You know, everything from, you know, infrastructure and social institution breakdown, uh, the, uh, our family issues, the taxation, mm-hmm. everything wrong in it. And so I just started to talk about those issues out loud and write about them. And I happened to have a client at the time, uh, NBC uh, was the client, and we were... Uh, on the tail end of My Black is Beautiful when I signed them on as a client. Mm-hmm. And I wrote a column about Sarah Palin. And she had become, you know, the uh, the selection for uh, John McCain to be her vice presidential running mate, be her right. vice presidential running mate. Right. I wrote that column and it went viral. Mm-hmm. I wrote that column and it was posted on ebonyjet.com <clears throat> and I started getting letters from as far away as Venezuela and Guatemala. Right. <laughs> um, uh, you know, email from Singapore and knew that now something had been captured. Mm-hmm. And I just began to write and write and write. And within weeks, you know, I was on the Rachel Maddow show. I was doing uh, the last word with uh, Lawrence O'Donnell. I was doing uh, within uh, six months, uh, Don Lemon every weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, similarly, somebody just hired me. They just took me off the street. And so I went to work for NBC News full time as a political analyst, and that's really where the national platform began. But I had been writing all of my life. I just decided one morning I was going to put that passion to work on behalf of people who I felt like did not have the voice necessary to have their issues heard. Yeah, that's why I created this show, to just let people hear these stories, because they only hear the, 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 the end effect, you know, when you're there. And, and this, oh, is, sure. this, is, this is a passion, and you wrote on passion, and uh, but I want to I want to go back to something that I mentioned in your credits. Uh, you know, my black is beautiful, mm-hmm. uh, 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 is which is an amazing campaign. I just want to talk about how. What, 
just give me, you know, you was at the forefront of uh, being the, the voice of making that happen. Tell me a campaign that, that became that, that relevant in our society. How did they come about? What was the what were the stages in making that? Because there was a lot of yes, there was a lot of no's, there was a lot of you know decisions that had to be made before it got launched. How does a campaign like that get launched? Well, it was a tough launch. Uh, we were at a small boutique agency in New York City, a place called Lippy Taylor, owned by a woman named Maureen Lippy, and you know, we had a client, Procter and Gamble, which they had a small piece of that business. Right. Uh, one of their assistant vice presidents, her name was Nigel Tito Reed, came into our offices one afternoon with a product manager, uh, named Eric Hayes, and a young, another young woman named Pamela Rudd, three young black executives from Procter & Gamble. Right. And Nigel began to tell us the story. You know, Nigel is a, a, a very dark complexion woman, and she began to tell us a story about when she was a child, She her mother brought her her first Barbie dolls, took mm-hmm. those dolls outside to play, and she lived in a predominantly white neighborhood. Right. And the little white girls told her her dolls couldn't play with them, that her dolls were ugly, that they could be the maid if they were going to play. And so Nigel went home crying, and she said to her mother, you know, they told me my dolls were ugly. They said I couldn't play with them. And she said, don't you know that black is beautiful? Mm. Now, Nigel was, you know, in her middle 40s today, and so we're talking about, uh, you know, the mid-70s when this all went down. Mm-hmm. Um, that night, her mother put her first copy of Essence and Ebony magazine on her pillow before she went to bed. And so Nigel said, I just want everybody to know that black is beautiful. And, and I think that there is a campaign in that, and I don't know what it is. Can we talk about that? And so mm. what was supposed to be an hour meeting went on for three or four until it was time for them to hit the plane and head back to Cincinnati. And what I said to her during the conversation was, you know, Blackness is a personal thing yes, it is. that we begin to talk about uh, colorism and, and what my perspective on blackness is and how I come to it is a very personal thing. And so if you qualify it with my and make it personal, then you have something. And so we began to talk about what that meant. You know, got the white boy drive racers out. <laughs> I flew home. I flew home to Atlanta that night, and it stayed with me. Right. What does my what does my blackness beautiful would mean? I turned it over to a vice president who was working for me on my team at that time, uh, Sandra Heath, and she wrote a poem. No one read wow. that poem for about three days. It was hung around in our email box, and then Nigel and I happened to open it on the same evening, and we called each other screaming. It was the original "My Black is Beautiful" poem. Wow. And from that poem, I said, "This is a national conversation." And so I wrote the creative brief, sent it back into T and G. And that initial plan, which cost about $150,000 total from soup to nuts, said that we were going to launch a national conversation by and for and about black women and who defines and sets their beauty cool. standard and who, who is able to awesome. profit from it and why. On the phone, Goldie Taylor. We'll be right back. Hi, it's Rashawn McDonald back with Money Making Conversation on the phone. Uh, because I want to give her all the time to talk about this great book, which I read this weekend called Paper Gods by Goldie Taylor, a novel of money, race, and politics. Goldie, are you back? I'm back. Okay. This one, I always get books because my, my staff always, they always laugh at me because I, I, I enjoy reading my books and I read them real fast. And so I always start, I look at the front, I look at the back, and then I, then I open up and I read the, the, the little little sleeve inside. This was really got me right here. I'm gonna try to be as I'm gonna try to be as dramatic as the tones that she wrote. Because you know, <laughs> Miss Taylor could write here. Here you go. Atlanta Mayor Victoria Dobbs Overstreet is a Harvard trained attorney and Spelman alum, married to a celebrated heart surgeon, mother to beautiful twin girls, and a political genius. When her mentor, ally and friend, Congressman Ezra Hawkins, is gunned down in Ebenezer Baptist Church, Victoria finds a strange piece of origami tucked inside his Bible. She had me! (laughs) (laughs) Origami! Origami! Who writes that? (laughs) Tucked inside the Bible, inside Ebenezer Baptist Church. Who shoots a congressman in church? Oh my God! Oh my God! She had me. She, I'm, I'm, I'm like flipping through pages, and there's some, it's some, it's, it's some stuff I can read, some stuff I can't read on there, some language, because she's a pretty salty. You know, she's a pretty salty book here. Yeah, it's salty. It's some, it's some, it's some, it's some, it's some real language in here, which I love about. It. So, 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 you know, when you when you mention names that we know, Spelman, sure, Ebenezer, sure. Atlanta, you, and there's so many other names, it feels it, the visual 
can't just 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 was in my head because those names in Atlanta are like you know Forty uh, Second Street or like uh, sure. Times Square or like uh, the Statue of Liberty in New York, and so 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 was it important to to uh, marry that level of uh, I want to say credibility to the characters you were trying to create. It was, but it wasn't just about, you know, sort of the marquee streets and institutions, but it was the back roads. It was the back rooms I wanted to take people into. And so I not only took you around, you know, the Atlanta University Center, but I took you into the bluff, mm-hmm. uh, which sits in the shadow of the AUC. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we spent, I not only took you to a chops at the lobster bar, I took mm-hmm. you into the back private room mm-hmm. downstairs in the basement where nobody knows where it is. Mm-hmm. And so it was important to me. Um, to not just be a tour guide of Atlanta, but to be a navigator mm-hmm. of our politics, of our you know our political landscape here, of the characters who make a business work here. I wanted to introduce people to this city in a new way. I think you remember A Man in Full back in the early '90s, written by uh, Tom Wolfe, uh, an outstanding you know iconic writer. Tom Wolfe wrote A Man in Full about Atlanta, but he wrote it from my what I call a helicopter view. Right, someone who's just someone who's just passing through, and so from the point that that book was published, and I read it back in the nineties, I said I'd love to write something like that, but written by somebody who knew the city, and so that's how Paper Gods was born. It was born out of our politics, out of how we do business here in the South. No, <coughs> excuse me. What were some of the challenges that you found in writing a, a base of political fiction that's on you know that deals with the black and white? Uh, divide in Atlanta, because it is a divide in any any city, but we are in the South, because I just heard that, sure. you know, basketball player, one of the basketball players from Milwaukee, uh, Buck said that Milwaukee was the most segregated city in America. So yeah. segregation still exists. So you're down in Atlanta, so we kind of get the feel that we're in the South, it kind of exists. So what, what, what complications did you run in, or was it just an emotional journey for you? Well, I think it was it was very much an emotional journey, but I think the, the complications of of race in Atlanta differ a bit because we've got a bit of a what I call a social contract here. Right. Uh, that you know every four years we have a contract between North Side money and South Side votes, and we get together and decide who's going to be mayor out of that. Right. Uh, this last one, this last one got a little sticky, uh, but, mm-hmm. <laughs> but generally speaking, they they work out pretty much the same way, and, and I wanted to explore why that was. Um, where did the divide come from? Mm-hmm. Who 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 brokered the contract? Right. And will that contract hold now that the demographics of the city itself, not the metro, but the city itself, are changing? And the book posits that if this contract were to become undone, that hell would have no fury, uh, like the folks who would come out on the losing end. And so that was really the premise, you know, really of Paper Gods is what happens when Atlanta's social contract comes undone. But, you know, when you, when you look, some people, some people on the outside go, look, they, they've had black mayors forever. You know, yeah. it's called, you know, black Hollywood, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, you have uh, prominent black uh, financiers, uh, entertainers, uh, the heart of a MLK Museum is here. So how can there be a, a racial divide for black people in Atlanta when you had all that success. It, well, well, it wasn't simply the coalescing of voting power that meant something to yes, the ma'am. city. You had to coalesce the voting power in places like St. Louis when Freeman Bosley was elected. You had to coalesce the voting power when Harold Washington was elected in Chicago. Chicago. Mm-hmm. But what you had, and that was back in the 80s, and, but what you had in Atlanta was not just a coalition of voting power, mm-hmm. but Maynard Jackson ushering a coalescing of economic power. Right. And what he did with the airport and, and, and Herman uh, Russell and what he did uh, with affirmative action across the city and really set uh, a brand new standard for how you do business in a majority black city. And that created hundreds of brand new black millionaires over yes, decades. And those black millionaires had children and more businesses and created jobs. And so Atlanta as a city became not just a powerhouse for black folks. Right. Uh, in terms of voting, but a powerhouse for black folks in terms of economic mobility. Yes. And that was the difference. But then you have to stand back and peel the onion and say, well, where did all the money come from? <laughs> and that's when you start to talk about the white, white financiers who wanted to do business in the city who decided they needed to sell an African-American partner. 
the business arm, Maynard Jackson's landscape. And that's where the contract really sits. It's not really in the voting booth. It's in the boardroom. Cool. On the phone is Goldie Taylor, uh, an incredible uh, political analyst. Uh, her new book, Paper Gods, a novel of money, race, and uh, politics. Uh, you can. It's in the stores right now, correct, Goldie? It is, it is indeed. It is. Uh, one of my friends called and said he tried a Costco eating. <laughs> it is everywhere. It is everywhere. They find books to sell from Barnes and Noble to Costco to Walmart and Target. You can get online, of course, at Amazon. Well, you know, uh, I'm going to tell you something. This is, uh, I, I, I tell people, because I'm a writer, I'm a sitcom writer, and I'm not a yes, novelist, really? and you, it's, you know, I see this book as a movie. I see this book as a series. I see this book. Are, are, are television opportunities coming your way because of your writing? Because this book, if it got optioned out, I would not be shocked. It was preempted, and so and that means it was bought uh, as options as a uh, dramatic series prior to its publication. And so uh, while we can't say who did it, uh, the preemption happened in June. The book came out in October, and now we are on to write the sequel. And so we are, uh, so Paper Gods has had uh, some immediate success, I think, based on its, its, strong, its stronger storytelling, based on its characterization, and, and the fact that Atlanta, you know, Hollywood is still enamored with us. Uh, they're not only enamored with our tax credits for bringing films here, they're enamored mm-hmm. with how things work out here. So right. they're looking to not just base productions here, but set them here, and that's a different thing. Um, and so you're seeing a lot, a lot more of that. Uh, Donald Glover's uh, Atlanta as a television show did extraordinarily well because people are frankly uh, intrigued with us as a city. And so Paper Gods went very quickly, um, and I'm working on a number of other original projects today that are both television and film, uh, but enjoying um, enjoying this brand new career for me. Well, congratulations. I wasn't shocked. You know, like I said, uh, you write. Uh, you know, like I said, it's 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 almost like a. Uh, I've I've been fortunate. My life, I, I was born in the inner city, and I uh, went to a all black high school. Went to a, a University of Houston, which is a predominantly white institution. And these lifestyles that we live, are, these stories that you tell, are, are, are layered in this book, where you see success and you see the street talk, you see the political talk, you see the the, the society talk, and you have to have all these layers. And I feel that the life that you live allows you to be able to communicate these different stories, but. It's just amazing. I, I feel fortunate to be able to share your story, and I want to promote this. So please send me your uh, any um, banners that you have so I can promote it on my social social media here, Ms. Taylor. Sure, sure. We've got a number of them. Uh, publisher has done, St. Martin's Press has been very good to me in terms of you know helping to cross-promote this book across social media within the bookstores. And so we've been, um, I've been blessed to say the least with you know, this being my third novel and knowing what I wanted it to do. I'm headed out to the Los Angeles uh, Festival of Books in April um, to speak on a panel about writing you know, political thrillers in this uh, Trumpian era, you know, what that's like, um, and how close to the bone can you really get uh, when you write thrillers such as these, um, you know, the complications that really come along with that. And so it's been a, uh, it's been a good, good time for me uh, writing-wise. Yes, ma'am. Uh, but to be able to do it and live and live in love here in Atlanta is a, is a Awesome. There's a whole new layer of, a of new book, to it. Paper Gods by Goldie Taylor, is in the stores now. I want to thank you for coming on my show. An amazing, amazing read. Uh, a novel of money, race, and politics based in Atlanta. The sequel's coming. It's going to be on TV. Keep winning.